Warning, Tongue and Geek contains heavy spoilers. If you haven't read, watched, or played the content being reviewed this episode, know that we will definitely spoil major plot points. Also, this show isn't for kids. We use words like f***, and c***, and it would take too much time and effort to edit them all out. Please don't tell our moms. Hello, lovely listeners, and welcome to Tongue in Queer, where a bi guy and his straight ally share a... Share blah, 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 fuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one's going in the blue okay. reel. No, I like how in the script I say hi guys when called on, which I do <laughs> it's, without prompting. You do it every time. I, I do know it every time. <laughs> and okay. Shado's, Shado's supposed to say hello with a little exclamation mark, which is exactly what I know she was going to do. <laughs> so. Okay, so I guess this is just going into the intro. I fucked it up, even though I have a script <laughs> right suppose. in front of me. Uh, welcome to Tongue and Queer. We're by Guy Straight Ally, blah, blah, blah. I'm Isaac. I'm Tyler, the, and, the straight ally, if yeah. nobody knew that. <laughs> and we're joined once again by our dear friend, Erica. Say hi, Erica. Hi, guys. Right on cue. That's a professional right there. Fantastic. <laughs> we are also joined for the fir- This is a tongue and geek first. We have four members on the squad today, which is crazy. Uh, we're joined by special guest, Shado. Say hi, Shado. Hello. Fabulous. Just also <laughs> exactly on cue. Today... <laughs> Today we're reviewing Harley Quinn, a 2019 DC animated series created by Justin Halpern, Patrick Shoemaker, and Dean Lorre. Tyler, would you like to give us some background on this one? The background on this one is that it's an animated series Uh um, about Harley Quinn Uh and her attempts to be the new awesome villain in Gotham since breaking up with the Joker. And it's about love and loss and the travails therein. Okay. And that's that's what I pulled out of my ass just now because guess what I didn't do. As per usual. <laughs> I'm hoping and I have a reason for not doing it because yes. behind the scenes Shadow said that this is her favorite running gag or one of her favorite running gags. Oh, so I did it for you. So <laughs> you've you've won Tyler points and you've lost Isaac points. <laughs> Well, one's it's, worth more than the other. When you do listen to them, like, consecutively, it's so obvious. <laughs> so it was great that she picked up on it. Every once in a while, we believe in you and you carry it I through. have to be that disappointing friend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if this, I don't know if I started recording before or after this was said, but I have in the show notes, under background, in italics and highlighted, Tyler's got this, I believe in him. <laughs> and... <laughs> It did not happen. So. <laughs> uh, Shadow, well, you know, do you have any notes for the background that you'd like to share with us? Um, so I think I have a lot of what you just said, but I put I found that the series was written and executive produced by Justin Halpern, Patrick Schumacher, and Dean Laurie. Because mm-hmm. I noticed when I was listening that you guys always had the background, so I was trying to do a little a little of my own. Uh, studying while I was trying to think of things to say during the podcast. Yeah. But uh, a little of my background goes into like kind of Harley Quinn and Ivy previously, like how they started yeah, in the sure. comics. So I didn't know if there was a timeline of when you talked about these. No, things, no, or... we listen, we used to have a formula and we've rapidly <laughs> realized that sticking to formula sucks ass. So just, Whatever ideas come into your brain, lay it out for us. It's completely off the cuff, no press. Okay. Uh, So, Harley actually made her introduction into the DC Universe in the Batman animated series. Mm -hmm. And she was introduced in uh, 1992 in the episode Joker's Favor. It's a fun Uh, one. She was actually... But yeah, she she was in... She was created by the showrunners Paul Dini and Bruce Tim, And yeah, it's just crazy to think that she's a character that wasn't actually introduced in the comics themselves, but in in the animated series and 
introduced later than Poison Ivy, who actually came in in, uh, I believe it was 1966. So- yes, 1966 in Batman number 181. Mm. So, oh, wow, going back. She's got numbers, Tyler. You never bring in numbers. <laughs> yeah. I just always thought, because we talk, I talk about this a lot with um, some of my other friends who also love Poison Ivy, how she doesn't really get the attention and like love that she deserves. Like, she was introduced so much earlier than Harley Quinn, but most people and most entities are more geared toward Harley Quinn, even though she came in later and outside of the comics. Yeah, she really Um, blew up. As soon as Harley Quinn hit the scene, people just loved her. Yeah, for me, I guess you could say I'm I'm a slightly newer Harley Quinn fan. Mm -hmm. I kind of started getting more of an interest in her when the first Suicide Squad movie came out with Margot Robbie. Yeah. And yeah, I just... For some, just something about her character and, and a huge part, Margot Robbie played her and she was amazing in the part. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really was what sprung my my interest in Harley. Awesome. Anybody uh, else want to talk about their history with Harley Quinn? I think uh, I think you and I covered our appreciation initially for Harley when we did our BTAS yeah. episode. Um, but Erica wasn't there for that. So... What if they haven't listened to that one? You're assuming everybody's sequentially listening to a good I, listener. I, I, I am. <laughs> you start at one and you go forward. There's a there's a yeah. there's a there's a lore to tongue and geek. <laughs> well, um, I mean For those who didn't, Tyler and I are big fans of Harley Quinn. We love her in the show. We think she's one of the best fleshed out characters in the show. Um BTAS, that is. Yeah. Just Big love. Can't say too enough praise about her. She's fascinating. Mm-hmm. She's fun. She's just a great character. And it's phenomenal and wild that she was introduced as a like female sidekick to the Joker and has been fleshed out into this entire entity of her own. Yes. And it's, it's not often that a newer character, even though she's been around for 30 years, um, that's still kind of new in terms of, you know, comic book publication. It's not often that newer characters become so popular. And um, the fact that she's probably as popular as Batman and the Joker themselves says a lot about her appeal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Erica, do you want to go now? Yeah. It's so hard to like pinpoint my history with Harley. It definitely would have had to be the Bat- you know, BTAS, Batman the Animated Series. It's so hard to pin down like when specifically that would have... I want to say 2006 to 2007 is when she first came on the scene. I And I just like immediately fell in love with her. I'd always loved Poison Ivy. Like she was a just hugely like impactful character in the terrible movie Batman and Robin. <laughs> I watched a lot as a kid. And I always loved Poison Ivy. I feel like when I was in high school, I started getting like my freshman year, maybe started getting more into reading comics, primarily DC. Whoop, whoop. And I saw a little bit of Harley then. And then later... Later on, I would work at Borders when that still existed. And I remember getting um, the Harley and Ivy comic that came out in 2007 called Harley and Ivy. Mm -hmm. And absolutely just eating that shit up. I was like, two of my favorite people have come together. And in that comic, like Harley has been completely rejected by the Joker, being rehabilitated by Ivy. And then they start falling in love. And I was like, we can do this. (laughs) Society will allow this. It was really exciting. Um, Tyler so, and I talked about it in the uh, BTAS episode, but there were hints of that happening in the cartoon itself back in the 90s, which is fucking yeah. wild. Mm-hmm. Like, there yeah. was definitely some, like, sexual chemistry going on between them even that early on. Yeah. I do remember that Harley, um, at one point, I wrote a paper in college that railed against the fact that definitely Poison Ivy and to some extent Harley, their backstory is like, they earned their doctorates by sleeping their way to the top. I remember vaguely writing a paper about that. And I also remember that they had gone back and forth on what uh, Harley's name should be. And it was almost Columbine. Um, cause that's a role. Yeah, because that's actually a reference to like the Italian character Harlequin had a lover named um, Ooh, yeah boy. had a lover named Columbine and I remember looking at that and being like ooh yeah I remember thinking that's 
so interesting. Um, and then I also remember going back and reading like Mad Love, which was pretty old, not by 60s standards or anything, but really enjoying that too. Yeah. And I then, get, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say my like history for the Harley Quinn show specifically, much like we've talked about on like different episodes, the most recent one, you know, listeners, if you're actually doing this sequentially, Shira, it's like where I just inhabit space on the internet related to Harry Potter, which is extremely welcoming <laughs> of LGBT like subjects. Which is I was wild. Just like, <laughs> yeah. <Consider laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was just kind of mosing along the internet and and then the internet was like, you need to see this picture of spoilers, Harley and Ivy making out from the Harley Quinn show. And I was like, sold, didn't even know that was a show. Got to. It will never not be funny to me that you absorb like all pop culture through the lens of Harry Potter, basically. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's that's pretty much true. And then um, fan fiction. And they're never wrong. (laughs) They never, ever steer you in the wrong direction. Oh, boy. I guess let's just get into the show. Quick synopsis. It starts episode one with uh, Harley dumping the Joker after he betrays her for like the umpteenth billionth time. And the whole gimmick of the first season is that she's trying to establish herself as a villain in her own right and join like the Legion of Doom and, you know, really get some credit and respect and reputation as a villain. And nobody's taking her seriously because she's a woman in a man's world of villainy. And it it's really funny how this show makes this sort of maniacal mundane. Like it turns, it's almost sort of like an office sitcom, but with over the top <laughs> violence, mm-hmm. just in the way that like all the villains talk to each other and interact with each other. You get this sense of like, it's just a bunch of guys at the office working together. They make the Legion of Doom seem so boring and mundane. Yeah, there is definitely an, an element of the, the workplace sitcom because the, the whole tone of the show is, is comedic, obviously, because it mm-hmm. stars Holly Quinn. So it takes this sort of irreverent, absurdist lens to the DC universe and doesn't take itself too seriously. Very violent, um, very sexual, yes. very mature audiences. Yes, yes, yes. I, I remember a lot of pushback against the show before it came out. People were already be you know poo pooing it, like, oh, it just, she's just like she's just DC's Deadpool. They're trying to rip off Deadpool, and it's gonna suck. And then then it came out, and everybody's like, oh my god, this is really good. <laughs> Who would have thought? Maybe if we give things a chance before shitting on them in the internet, we might like them. You can't do that on the internet. <laughs> yeah, you have to be an, a negative Nelly and, yes. and a jaded cynic on the internet <laughs> in order to have fun, apparently. So I started watching the Harley Quinn animated series um, because the boy that I was talking to at the time, I had a crush on him and he was like, you really need to watch this. And I think you'll really, really like it. Uh, spoiler alert. That's my current boyfriend. So it all worked Aww. out. Uh, <laughs> but I ended up watching it with a friend of mine and we we love how they kind of take the DC villains and then just kind of bring them down to an everyday level. Yeah. Like one of our our favorite parts <clears throat> was in the very first episode where they have Harley and Batman above the supposed acid and Ivy tells her that she had to like basically had to scout you know, the entire city to find all this margarita mix. And it's so funny to just think of (laughs) Ivy going to all these stores and just grabbing up just cartfuls of margarita mix to set up this whole whole scheme. It makes Gotham feel a lot more like a real world place. Like everything's a lot more grounded. Not in like the way that we usually talk about Batman movies being grounded as like gritty and dark and like everything's, you know, it's more like... These are real people going about their everyday lives, and there just happen to be a bunch of costume lunatics fucking around. The Gotham yeah. here feels a lot more like a real place with just a bunch of crazy ass people in it. Yeah, the the villains they have work functions and parties that some of them don't want to go to, but have to keep up appearances. <laughs> and, mitzvah. <laughs> and they all have their own foibles and just like inner conflicts, and of course, and this. Mm. This show has my favorite depiction of Gordon <laughs> in any oh, Batman oh, media. Because yeah. he's just perpetually just on the edge of losing it. He's a lunatic. Just, just red-rimmed eyes, just no sleep, just like alcoholic, just 
just just can't take it anymore. He's just a good cop. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Batman is he's not in it a lot, which is good. I think he's just kind of like portrayed as like a stuck up hard ass. And he's just like there. It's fantastic. <laughs> Harley, um, I think this is one of the better adaptations of as well um, in any media she's been depicted in. She's still outwardly a villain. She's very much villainous. But, you know, they, they give her the friendships and relationships that ground her and make you care about her because she invests in, you know, her people. And she's kind of just this little wrecking ball that <laughs> <laughs> bounces through Gotham and just gets into shit and, like, needs to find a way to get out of it and to fix it and help herself and help her friends and hopefully find love. Speaking of the love, since this is tongue and queer, I guess maybe we should focus on the relationship aspect of the characters. Yeah. As I said, I didn't really get uh, invested in Harley Quinn until the Suicide Squad movie. So I didn't have a lot of history of knowing much about her and Ivy together. And so a lot of my knowledge up until the animated series was mostly Harley based. So I, I, again, as I said, even though Ivy has been out for so much longer than, than Harley, because I just connected with Harley so much, I never really dug deep in, into the side where her relationship with Ivy or Ivy in general. So when I started the series, I actually had no idea that they were going to build up to them having a relationship because that wasn't something that I had ever found on my own or I had heard about it, but I thought it was more of like a uh, like a fan wish. Like that's what the fans wanted. Yeah. Just seeing that build up for me, it, it was just done so well. The way that they created the arc between them and then falling in love, it was all so like natural and organic and you're just just waiting and waiting for it to happen once you started realizing, you know, it was leading up to this point. So yeah, it was it was a part of the show that I wasn't expecting, but was very pleased with um, because it was handled so well. Well, that's awesome that like you went into it and you just you didn't know about the ship and then it was popular and that DC itself like supported it. So that's that's cool that like you actually discovered that as the show was happening. Mm -hmm. And with Har um, Ivy, I mean, because she's had such a history in the comics and uh, other Batman media, um, her origin changes here and there. Her characterization changes here and there. This one sticks with like the sort of it exaggerates her like misanthropic uh, nature. She's she's a bit of a man hater. She's sarcastic. She's dry, mm. and she really only has patience for Harley. So there's that kind of classic give and take of like Ivy's kind of the the, the straight man. <laughs> That's no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the straight man of the duo, while Harley's like the, the crazy one, and they they they, they clash, but they complement. It's that very and, um, classic pairing of the grumpy pants who doesn't like anybody except for person A and the person who loves and is like super excited about everything and thinks that person B is like the greatest out of everything else in the world. And it's a fun classic pairing dynamic. And here it feels even better just because Harley is so over the top enthusiastic about everything, whether it's like hell yeah, let's do this shit, or it's like, fucking hell, why the hell is this going on? Like, she's yeah. always so high energy in every scene she's in, and you got, she's kind of dragging Avi along, but not in the way that, like, is obnoxious, it's more like Avi's like, I'm starting to care about shit again, <laughs> just because I'm interacting with someone who cares <laughs> so much about Are these about feelings? Are these emotions? <laughs> yeah. I haven't felt this in a while, kind of like Dennis from It's Always Sunny, like, you guys have feelings, you remember those? <laughs> <laughs> you never had any feelings. Yeah. So I, like I said, I loved it from the very first time I read that comic in 2007. And I think it, it makes so much sense. And it's so nice and awesome and supportive. And like, I saw some people, I mean, because it's everybody has to hate on everything, especially on the internet. I saw some people... When the show came out being like, oh, like Harley's with the Joker first. And then it's like, now she's with Ivy. Like, why does she have to be with anyone? Like, it's a bad <laughs> message. She should just like stand on her own two feet. Like, that's so toxic. Like, everybody needs to shut up because point, like Ivy is amazing. And I like how in this show, we definitely get some of the stuff that we get in um 
the 2007 comic, but like in a different way. We we I feel like Poison Ivy at her core is very like protective of her emotions. Like she finds people in like a found family scenario and then eventually lets them in and starts caring about them and harley's one of those people in the 2007 comic when she finds uh harley all messed up after joker uh shot her shot her on a rocket i believe is what happened just like didn't even care what happened to her and in that comic she's like nursing her back to health and harley seems like she's doing better but then she's still kind of drawn back to the joker and she's like why like are you doing this like why are you making these terrible decisions like i'm here for you why would you go back to that idiot and that literally plays out again in the harley quinn show and i just feel like it's done so well so it's so exciting i feel like there's such a poison ivy is one of my favorite characters and there's just so many different ways you can portray her other than just the like i'm this like sexy jessica rabbit person who's just like blowing pheromones at people like left and right like that's that's work ivy (laughs) like that's work (laughs) ivy punching that clock like Mm -hmm. there's a lot more to her than that so i really like that and i feel like the genuine like emotions that they can express in this animation is really charming because the animation to me a little bit feels very like saturday morning cartoony i don't know that's just the vibe i get from it and their faces are so expressive like when ivy will say something and like harley's whole face will light up Mm -hmm. i feel like it's just so like just i don't know it's it translates a lot through just animation the animation in this series is very good uh yeah it's great for the comedy it's great for like character expression like you mentioned because they have sort of the big cartoonish faces that stretch really well for like big funny smiles or you know real sad moments too the action's really good gets really brutal in places Mm -hmm. there's some really dark comedy some really dark comedy in this series (laughs) like surprisingly dark even though it's like an hbo i don't is it it's an hbo max exclusive it was originally a dc universe exclusive when it had its own thing and yeah. then it got absorbed into Oh, yeah, HBO that Max. doesn't exist anymore, yeah. yeah. So, so even though it's, like, on an adult platform, like, I was actually kind of taken aback by kind of how dark and violent it gets. Not, like, invincible levels of violent, but pretty violent. Yeah. <laughs> and and just to go back to Harley and Ivy as a pairing and, like, what makes them work is they're both women who have been fucked over by the men in their life, by men, by the patriarchy, if you mm-hmm. will. Ivy's just got her guard up about everybody. She just, she hates people. She mm-hmm. doesn't like people. She doesn't trust people. She doesn't feel safe around them. She'd wish that she, they, that they weren't around and she just wants her plants with Harley. When she comes into her life, she doesn't feel, she doesn't sense any, anything behind Harley other than who Harley is. Like Harley doesn't want anything from Ivy. She's not trying to get anything from her or do anything to her. So there's that, vulnerability that's already there where Ivy can just kind of relax around her and allow Harley to let herself into Ivy's life. And I think uh, this show does a really good job of exploring that dynamic. One of the best aspects of that is throwing Kite Man in the wrench. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, we've got to, we need to talk about Joker and Kite Man because there's... Throwing some... him in the wrench? Throwing him in the wrench. Yes, that's my new term that, that I've coined just now. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. <laughs> throwing... <laughs> throwing him in the ring? He's the wrench that gets thrown in the machines or he's getting thrown in the ring? He's the wrench that gets thrown in the ointment for the fly in the ring. <laughs> okay. mm. I also... It annoys me that I feel like there's this narrative sometimes where it's like... We were just having this conversation, what, Sunday, where it's like there will be a strong female character and people will be like, oh, I hate that she ended up with somebody. Like, she just like such a strong, independent woman yeah. and she don't need no partner. Like, stupid, yeah, I hate that stupid idea of a strong female character. First off, I hate that term in general, but like... yeah. This idea that uh, like, Isaac, you're a man. You can't hate that term. I can't hate the term strong female character. <laughs> yes. <Fuck it. laughs> but like this idea that they have to end up with somebody just because like, why are we assuming that strength equals being alone? Being alone. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Y- yeah. I wanted to call that out too, because there's, there's always that when there's a quote unquote strong female character where people just they don't want them to have a romantic interest because they think that takes away their independence or the strength that they have or the development that they have and it's like well that's just kind of a shitty outlook on relationships if you think that that takes away somebody's yeah you know 
agency or, or values, you know? <laughs> I mean, I do get that there's probably people out there who are happily single, like do not want to be with a partner. And that's a hundred percent valid. There's right. no reason that's something you have to have in your life. And maybe they want the representation and God knows we need more representation for so many things. But like, I just don't, I just don't see why it seems like that narrative just like continually comes up whenever there is a strong female character, especially if it's one who was previously in a bad relationship. It's like, oh no, girl, you got out of that bad one. So just have no relationship for the rest of your life. It's one of those counter narratives that started out from a place of good intentions where we saw all of these female characters that were put into Mm -hmm. media as, you know, just love interests and people start pushing them back against that. But like with all of these counter, uh, Fuck, I already forgot the same term I just used to say. Counter narrative. Counter narrative. Yeah. yeah. Good God, I'm off it tonight. Like all counter narratives, there tends to be an overcorrecting where they go too far in the other way, where it's like, now we need a counter narrative against the counter narrative to sort of bring us back in the yeah. middle. Because, like, uh, we're not. Just because they did romance bad in the past and sometimes still continue to do romance bad doesn't mean we should throw out romance entirely. It's like, you're not going to get rid of like one of the core experiences of the human condition. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which isn't to say that you can't have like an aromantic story or something. I would love to get that kind of representation, but to saying that, that there shouldn't be any romantic representation ever is like, okay, let's take out stories about, I don't know, working or trying to survive or any kind of like core human Mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. And I just think when it comes to characters like, like Harley, there's that, that urge from the storytelling perspective and from the person who is engaging in the story to want to see them be successful at something that was previously a failure, Mm -hmm. you know, like she had a terrible, awful, abusive relationship with the Joker. And so like, there's that yearning that, you know, we want to see her eventually get with somebody that appreciates her and loves her and won't hurt her. And they can thrive together, which is something that they wanted in the past, but it didn't work out. Finding love and enjoying stories of finding love. Like you said, that's just like, that's most people, you know, <laughs> like we can't just do away with that because in, sometimes in it's one done shape for or me. another, too. It's also like this Harley's story in particular is one of understanding what love is like her whole arc through this story is her learning that like what she had with the Joker was not love. What she has with Ivy is love. And I think that w- what makes that so strong is that her relationship with Ivy throughout most of this is more of one of a friend than a lover. The romantic mm-hmm. attraction really doesn't become explicit until the latter half of the second season. And that's perfect because we're getting to see what love looks like to Harley. Yeah, they're not. It's not two seasons. The third one's premiering soon. Boop, 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 boop. Um, it's not two seasons of them just like, you know, longingly gazing at each other when one turns their back or something like that and pining. It's the story of two people yeah. slowly realizing like, oh my God, like, I think I love this person. And a lot of it's through facial expression, which again is really cool. Like through j- just regular conversations and gestures and facial expression. And since we're talking about the third season, there have been images released and Harley and Ivy are both wearing amazing bomb dresses with your hair done up. <laughs> they are. Like they're at a gala and I need to know what that's about. It really looks beautiful. Like almost as beautiful as the fan art that Shadow has graced gracious, us with. Yes, graciously yes. donated to our pod for the, uh, for the cover here. It's beautiful. Yes, thank you for that because it's yeah. awesome. Speaking of Shadow, she's still here. Let's let her talk for I a am. second. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, take the flow. Okay. Um trying to think of where I wanted to go next in the in the conversation. So we yeah, so they do have the two seasons are coming out with the third season, but they there is actually I haven't been able to confirm if it's going to be a continuation of this or if this was just like a canon divergence, but there's a comic series or six and yeah. it's called the oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Kill Tour. Mhm. Yes. And so for me, I 
binge watch the first season in one day and then the second season in one day. <laughs> That's nice. how much I loved this series. And so right after I finished, uh, I started getting the comics because at the time that that happened, they were coming out monthly. So I I had to wait each month to get them. Um, so barbaic, archaic. <laughs> I know. Imagine how, like after having been able to binge both seasons, how can I possibly wait? All content should exist already. <laughs> you shouldn't have to wait for this. Yeah. I did that enough with Harry Potter. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so the what made me think of this is that Erica mentioned the... Uh, them wearing the dresses is that in the Eping Kill Tour, they do go to like this party event and they both get dressed up in these amazing outfits. And so when I saw the art for the upcoming season, um, I was really excited to to see that because I think that's one of my favorite parts of Harley is seeing what creation they can come up with her next, what outfits, what design. I know a lot of people aren't a big fan of her like pink and blue look. So I really like that in the in the animated series, they kind of meshed the two. So she still has her yeah. classic like black and red, uh, but with the pink and blue yeah. hair and makeup. I feel like I, I haven't met a lot of other fans uh, of the animated series, like in person, I guess I should say. I don't know why or how it could be better, but I wasn't the biggest fan of Ivy's costume. I'm so glad I that somebody else said that. Yeah. <laughs> in the show? <laughs> in the show, yeah, sorry. In the yeah. animated series. It is just kind of like a like an outfit, isn't it? It's not really even a costume. Yeah. Like, I don't really understand the pants, like... They go into the foot. Yeah. So are they like leggings that like <laughs> go over the toe? Like I just, I haven't, it's, they did give her a, an, a different outfit in the Eat Bang Kill Tour and it's amazing. Like mm -hmm. I wish that we had that outfit in the animated series. I don't know. I like her bitch and jacket. She's got a bitch and jacket. She does her, got a bitch and her jacket. Her jacket is jacket, really good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I feel like she gives off major like bisexual vibes with her outfit, which is always good. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just like there are so many cool iterations of outfits that she has had. And like in that teaser for season three, her dress is basically just a vine that wound itself around her. Like, it looks so cool. Uh, no. You know what? I am looking at her lower half right now. Well, that sounds creepy <laughs> in my head. Um, Don't worry, we've just, all looked at her lower it's, half. It's just, like, green leggings with an ivy kind of around. Yeah, it's... The jacket's the only thing that really stands mm -hmm. out on her costume from the show. Mm -hmm. um, two things. Um, should I... Um, I hope you're going to make that costume for your boyfriend um, so you guys can cosplay as that. Um, I'd love to see him in it. Um, the, because, the jacket uh, or the wound? The wound the vine, wound vine dress? Okay, yes. yes because I would love to see him in that. Her boyfriend would look <laughs> really yes. good. And I, I think just to get more, you know, analytical here, um, I think that they kind of made Ivy's, you know, baseline look in the show a bit more, uh, quote unquote, drab because, you know, Harley's the, you know, the more outgoing and boisterous one and she's got more of that bombshell cheesecake cheesecakes is a comic book term for sexy chicks with <laughs> long hot legs T stop mansplaining um, and get to your point <laughs> <laughs> i'm not mansplaining it's a real term damn it that's you're mansplaining it god damn i'm you. explaining it to the audience you bastard anyway <laughs> visual juxtaposition is is my point visual juxtaposition between the two of them so they, they can't they can't just have two really, really hot chicks hotting each other out. It'll cancel out the visuals, you know? So they, they have to make one a little more austere than the other, is what I'm saying. <laughs> That's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. You know what the dumbest shit I've ever heard is? Your voice. I'm wow. quitting the pod right now. All right, fantastic. <laughs> Shadow. This has been, been <laughs> tongue and Queek slash tongue and Gear. I'm out. I'm thinking that's a reason. <laughs> oh, that I'm gonna every... miss this high level content that Tyler <laughs> brings to the table. <laughs> Making fun of I a think... person with a speech impediment. Now look who's gonna get canceled. You are. I'm yeah. Cancel all of <laughs> you, you have an impediment. <laughs> 
I, I have an impeachment. I think, impeachment. I think the reason everybody's messing up is because the pressure of Shadow, number one fan. It's it's like so decades long friend of Erica being here is just <laughs> so intense that we all want to do so well. Yes. That Tyler's throwing wrenches in <laughs> in, in, in the ring with smiling. No, he's throwing yeah. things into the wrench. Yeah, and, and I did just drink a pint of beer. So. Speaking of which, let's get to one of the other characters. Let's talk about Kite Man because this complicates uh, okay. this whole relationship. Yeah. Um, so Kite Man, who is an actual DC villain that exists, unbelievably um, that he is, is yeah. along with Condiment King, <laughs> along with Somehow. Condiment King, his lifelong rival. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Oh um, my god. Kite Man is Ivy's boyfriend throughout most of this series, up until actually the very finale, uh, where they were going to get married, but due to Harley's um blossoming feelings for Ivy and Ivy's blossoming feelings for Harley, that doesn't go as planned. How do we feel about the whole Kite Man relationship? I want to start. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, what I like about Kite Man is, like, after my initial shock that this was, in fact, a real guy that mm-hmm. did exist. Yes, um, and a very popular guy, because, uh, not to interrupt, um, he, he recently... Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, coming from you, that's rich. <laughs> um, anyway, he just had a big resurgence in the, in the comics in recent years, so that's why he's in the show. Mm, okay. Take the floor, Erica. Okay. Um, we talked about in the she podcast how, like, we enjoy the dynamic of, like, I'm, I'm, I'm just tolerating your presence. Like, you're such an embarrassment, but I'm actually <laughs> endeared to you. I'm, like, kind of like you. I could, I could easily make you leave if I really wanted to. Yeah. We talked about that um, with Mermista and Seahawk, and that's 100% what's happening with Ivy. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Completely same dynamic. Yeah, it's 100% the same dynamic, and I didn't realize it's a dynamic that I really, really like. Mm-hmm. I love her begrudgingly, like, coming to see, like, <sighs> hey, like, I actually do like this guy. Like, and he's just so endearing and so wholesome against this, like, insane backdrop. It's it's a great dynamic because I think it hits on something surprisingly deep, which is usually this dynamic is based on one party is by all social standards, usually by physical beauty, way out of the other one's league. Mm-hmm. Such as with Poison Ivy being way out of Kite Man's league, but it usually ends up being the person who's supposedly like the loser teaching the other one some very valuable lessons about themselves and how to just live. Because Kite Man, for all of his like lame and loser tendencies, is a very like emotionally mature and self assured guy. Like he's kind of a schmuck, but like he knows what he wants out of life and. He's much more willing to, like, accept himself than the rest of the characters in this show. (laughs) So, like, Ivy actually learns a lot through him because he's very clear about what he wants out of the relationship. He's very clear about, like, what he feels for her. And she kind of doesn't understand these things herself and has to come to terms with it. Throughout the whole thing, Kite Man's just a good dude. Uh, Like, a loser who... Granted, a lot of the way he talks and acts is, like, pretty freaking lame, but, like, he's a good guy under it all. Yeah, and um, what I love so much about this trope, and especially what I love about this show and how they handled this whole dynamic with them, is that it would have been so easy for them to just make Kite Man, you know... A douchebag that you mm-hmm. just want to see like Harley Quinn get out of the way or Ivy to get out of the way but it dev- they they give they pay enough respect to the characters in the show to make him dimensional in his own right and to where like you f- kind of feel you know wishy-washy on what you want Ivy's decision to be because by the time season two culminates, you kind of you don't want her to break Kite Man's heart because he's proven himself to be a good guy who's who loves her, who's loyal to her. He kind of hits the himbo trope, but he's not totally a himbo. He's just not very good at being a villain. <laughs> so I have to applaud the, the writers for not taking the easy road out and just making him a joke that yeah. you want to see, like you know, get his just desserts. Right before. Because I knew we had been planning on this podcast for a while. Me and my boyfriend did rewatch both the first and second season leading up to today. And while we were rewatching it, we were kind of talking about Kite Man and 
like how we felt about him and Ivy's relationship. And I know everybody interprets things differently. For us, we kind of wondered exactly how deeply they loved each other. It almost seemed like Kite Man had this vision of who he wanted, uh, you know, his potential spouse to be, what they mm-hmm. wanted their life to be like. Mm-hmm. And he saw Ivy and instead of really thinking, oh, like this is everything I want. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this the right way. That he kind of rushed into everything with her without fully thinking, is this actually what he wants or is this just a an idea of what yeah. he wants? Yeah, good point. And, good point. And we kind of felt the same way with Ivy. Like we were saying, you know, she's never really had a good relationship with men. Uh, here comes Kite Man, who is a decent man, who treats her well. For her, that was enough. But did she really deeply love him or was he just safe? Right. Absolutely yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's definitely what it is, is that she realized he was safe. And then mm-hmm. she kind of, even though she did develop feelings for him, um, she kind of ignored like the questions she had because he was safe. Yeah, their relationship was it, it was problematic the entire time, but not like in a way that it felt like either of them was a bad guy in the relationship. Mm-hmm. Cotman legitimately, I think Cotman legitimately mm-hmm. had strong feelings for her, but he was wrapped up in this idea of what he wanted out of a relationship to the point and you see it a lot with the wedding stuff like he's got all of this i have to go to the corn factory and get, have my wedding oh, yeah, at the yeah. corn factory <laughs> he's so wrapped up in this vision of like what a perfect relationship looks like and poison ivy's really not about it and you can see she's tr- kind of trying to like make herself feel that way for him but yeah i do think it is a lot of like she found someone who was genuinely kind to her, who genuinely cared about her, and she just immediately clung to that because there's so few people in her life who do that for her. I think her and Harley make a much better couple because they're much more actually honest with how they feel around each other, not just towards each other, but in general. Whereas with Ivy and Kite Man, it was always more of Ivy's sort of changing the way she acts to be with him because he's a nice guy and she doesn't want to, you know, make him feel bad. Yeah. It wasn't that she was dating him out of pity. It was more that she was dating him because there was this good person in her life and she hadn't had that before. Yeah. Like he, he kind of proved her just assumptions about like dudes and people in general wrong, but that, that kind of like, eventually just kind of like blinded her to what she didn't dig about the whole thing Mm -hmm. to where she uh, embraced it maybe when she shouldn't have, which um, juxtaposes the Joker (laughs) who of course has to worm his way back into Harley's life. Yeah. In, in various ways. There are depending on what, depending on what canon we're going by also killed kite man's son. Yes. That happens in the comics. With a, with a, Yes, with yeah. a poison kite, Isaac. Dude, poison oh, kite what? string. Kite, kite Man is yes. a deep, tragic character yeah. in the oh comics. God. Yes. Oh, no. Also, I know for a fact, because I remember seeing this, that Joker once pushed him off a tower without his kite. Oh my god. Joker is just a bad person. Jo- oh, yeah, Joker is a bad person. There's the tagline <laughs> for the episode. There's a hot take. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody's ever really thought about it, guys, but... <laughs> I don't know uh, if anybody's yeah. figured this out yet. <laughs> Wait a second. The Joker's kind of a dick. Um, <laughs> he's kind of an asshole. There are yeah. so many interpretations of the Joker. There's so many different versions of him as a villain. And mm-hmm. what I really like about this version of him is that he seems like a guy who thinks he's funny, but isn't. Like, so many versions of the Joker have him being, like, ridiculously over-the-top funny or being, like, super freaking scary. This version of the Joker is that asshole who says a bunch of mean shit and does a bunch of mean shit and thinks it's funny while everybody else around laughs out of nervousness and fear. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a very good interpretation of this character for the story being told through Harley. Because, like, we all know that douchebag who thinks they're funny, but what they really are is just mean. 
<coughs> Isaac. <coughs> Fuck off, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a very good way to put it. He's kind of just a bully. Like, I mean, you can say any interpretation of the Joker's a bully, but here they emphasize that he's just a, a petty, manipulative bully. And the Jokerness aspect of it is kind of just like, shut the fuck up, dude. Like, just <laughs> shut the fuck up and go away. You're not edgy. You're not cool. You're not funny. You're just a prick. Mm hmm. When we were talking about Kite Man, I wanted to mention how I saw this meme that I really liked where it was like Ivy and she's looking at like an RSVP she got for her wedding for Kite Man. And Ivy's like, Selena sent me a get better soon card. And Harley's like, oh, that's sweet of her. And Ivy's like, no, I'm not sick. She just thinks I can do better than him. <laughs> like, and I just really liked it because I feel like that's it. That's what we all think the whole time as it's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's what's fun about his characters. It's like, oh, shit, he's actually like a nice guy. Yeah, he undermines like, that idea of him just being out of, like, her being out of his league. And what yeah. I really, go, to go back to Cop Man for a minute, what <laughs> I really love about the ending with him and the end of season two is that after their mm -hmm. whole wedding falls apart due to a whole bunch of shit, Gordon brings in the cops trying to arrest all these villains, Harley throws yeah. shit, makes shit wild, just goes all to hell, Cop Man is the one to break things off. It's not Ivy like yes. dumps him and is like, you know, I actually love Harley. I can't do this. Kite Man's mm -hmm. the one who's like, I deserve better than this. Yes, I deserve someone who away. loves me. And then he walks mm -hmm. away. Yeah, it's badass. And it's like, he's also not, I feel like him saying that, it's not even like a huge fuck you to her. No, it's, it's, like, him, it's, it's him yeah. expressing that like, I deserve someone who is going to want to spend the rest of their lives with me and make me happy as much as I want to make them happy. And you're mm -hmm. not it. And there is a bit of a, like, you tell her m to it, but it's not supposed to be disrespectful. It's him standing yeah. up for himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like how we went back to Kite Man. I know. <laughs> like, we we got to talk about like two seconds on the show. We got to talk about Bane and how this is the best iteration of Bane <laughs> that has ever existed. We've got this so many things to talk about. <laughs> Joker, Joker. Uh, what else to say about Joker? Uh, it's funny that he lives with that, that, like, single mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because his stepdad. Yeah. And, like, takes it seriously. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like his design is really good, because Shadow and I have talked about it several times, where we're just like, I mean, we obviously, like, yes, the Joker's interesting, but we're just like, for the love of God, can we see other people? Like, it's not just you, sir. Yeah. So, I feel like he's in it enough. And not too much, and it, I like the way he looks. It's really good that they take him out throughout most of season two, because yeah. he was a central focus in season one as sort of the primary mm -hmm. antagonist, and then mm -hmm. removing him for most of season two is great, because then we really get to focus on Harley and Ivy's re developing relationship from then on out. Yeah. You know, I kind of don't want to talk about the Joker. Well, fuck him. <laughs> We're moving on He's from a him. bad guy. <laughs> he's, he's, a bad, he's, he's a bad guy. He's a bad guy. Let's um, talk about some other gave characters. Kite Man's son a poison kite. <laughs> you want to you want to hit Bane real quick, Erica? What the bad Bane? Oh my god! I like I I'm literally like fucking podcast. <laughs> there's sometimes where stuff just like transcends funny. It's so funny, and like one of those is when Isaac and I were watching the Spider Man movies and this joke he made about Aunt May and Peter Parker's killer hands. <laughs> Really me, and I'm just like forever like, oh my god, it's so... I can't believe like, we didn't talk about that in the Raimi trilogy episode. That was my favorite running grass. I wasn't there, right? I wasn't it's there true. for that. You were there my... for it. I was there to watch, but not to talk, because I don't know what I would say. But there's some stuff like that where I'm just like, this is so funny. I cannot believe how funny this is, and that's Bane in this. It's like... I can't, this guy who every single time he's anywhere, I'm just like, I get that it's supposed to be cool that you have this juice and you're amped up and, you know, you broke Batman's back or whatever. I get it. I, I don't care. And they bring him in here and I'm just like, and then I'm just like, God, please put more Bane in. Like, we haven't had a Bane scene in a while and I need it. <laughs> it's, oh, it's so funny. The fact that he's the biggest guy in the room and everyone just bullies him yes. all the time. Yeah. It's What's so his... 
And he has like the running joke of like this will be the reckoning. Yeah, or, like, be the I'm reckoning. Be but, like the for- stupid coffee shop. He just yes, keeps saying he's like, blow places up. Yeah. <laughs> but like for everything. And then just him putting like all this effort into like, I'm gonna blow it up. What do you mean they switch shifts? <laughs> <laughs> like- <laughs> When he said that he was gonna blow up the chicken satay at a party, I fucking like yeah, that's my favorite yeah, line of anything ever. Really They're funny. serving chicken satay yeah. at a party, and like there's like an exchange of dialogue, and he just like under his breath and in his mash, like blow up the chicken yeah. satay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, He's so um, good. The show is is really good at either taking like the basic characteristics of a character and exaggerating them to a high degree or taking the characteristics of a character and totally subverting them. And what they do with Bane is subvert it where he's this in the comics and in other media, he's like the ultra serious planner. He's like a mastermind. He's a physical threat as well as a mental threat. There's like nothing comical or funny about him. Yes. And in the show, they just make him a fucking a joke, like to everybody around him. It's like, he's like a crack fan fiction version of himself, but it like is extremely, extremely successful and amazing and funny and just at, like when he was like with lex luther and stuff like oh <laughs> my god when they're forming a crew i like the running like, gag that he can't get a chair <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> Oh my god! At, like every single place he goes to, he's in the Legion of Doom, and he's got like a crappy little spin chair, yes. and he's like creaking yep. and stuff. He's like, "This is small for me." And then at one point, they have a fold-out <laughs> chair for him, and he's like, "Oh, damn it!" Yeah, I don't know if you remember, but there's like an episode literally called "A Seat at the Table" uh-huh. because of that. And in that episode, like Bane was dressed up as like a magician and was trying to do magic. And then, like, it was finally his turn to do it. And Lex is like, no, there's no time. Like, we have to talk to Harley now. And he's just so dejected. (laughs) And then later, he, like, goes up to Harley. And he's like, pick a card. And then he can't do it. He doesn't even do it right. (laughs) He's like, is this your card? And she's like, no. And he's like, go on, draw it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then just, like, just Todd doesn't work on Wednesdays. Like... (laughs) <laughs> everything that Bane was ever doing and then he like he just can't do the coffee machine do you guys remember that mm-hmm. that was in season two I think like oh and, man and, and then <laughs> like he tries to sit in a chair in season two as well you, you give somebody a funny voice and it's still <laughs> hilarious after all these years of comedy yeah somebody with a funny voice <laughs> I'm gonna laugh so it's the fact that Bane throughout the entire show was just he's muffled and he has this funny way of speaking yeah. and he's always he's just guy. He's frustrated with things. It's, it's, it's just it's hilarious yeah. just listening to him. I feel like like we talked about before, the show does a really good job of it being like, hey, look at how like this is like kind of regular people and this is like kind of nine to five. Like look at how they're even on the highway. Like this is their job. This is the thing that they do. And then. Bane just kind of takes it and is like, yeah, but please remember this is ludicrous. These people are all wearing (laughs) tights. Yeah. Like, they're all so petty and weird. Like, so it's just such a fun juxtaposition. And uh, I, he just really shines. I just fucking love it. Shido, do you have anything to say about about Bane that we haven't said in 10 minutes? (laughs) So, like, I guess my favorite part about Bane is they do show him, you know, to be not as intelligent as the other villains, but I do feel like he had a fairly successful prison. Like yes. his prison <laughs> cave seemed like all the inmates were thriving. They were seemed pretty happy with uh, with his care as the warden. Uh, so that was the one thing that it seemed like he was doing really well. Um, so we really like enjoyed that part and watching him be the warden and <laughs> just yeah the way that he talks and the way that he is just <laughs> I don't yeah <laughs> sorry yeah he's he's a great character and uh there are so many scenes of his that are good but for some reason it's just him as the warden in the second season uh, is probably one of my my mm-hmm. favorite scenes. It, it's funny too because yes, he's the he last of the villains in season two to get taken down. Because all of most of season two is Harley going on like a revenge kick against like the other Batman villains after they betray her, and like Bane's the last one standing. Like all the others get taken down before Bane. And uh, I want to thank you, uh, Shadow, for bringing up the prison thing because it's actually kind of a, a deep thing to do with the character because his whole origin is that. 
he was born in prison and he had to fend for himself as a child and the prison was just this <laughs> you were too loud so you kind of cut out there so I don't know what you do. <laughs> yeah she was born in the dark molded by it so his his terrible experience growing up in a prison made him want to run a good prison yeah. so I love how that's just like a little arc that he goes through in this do you think they chant this is awesome awesome <laughs> that that's that's a inside joke between you and me yeah. that nobody knows what the hell it is. <laughs> Not even half of the people on this episode. There's going to be a good 10 Do minutes you... of just unlistenable audio content of us doing bad Bane impersonations that are not going to yeah. get picked up on these mocks. Do you guys bad have... Bane impersonations have happened since the Dark Knight Rises. I don't know if you guys ever noticed it, but like like I said, there was that one episode I loved where he was like messing with the coffee machine and like he has coffee several times in the episodes. He has a coffee mug and it says in all caps, caffeine is my reckoning. <laughs> like, there's just so much little things they put in for Bane and where mm-hmm. he's all just like, uh, just like you said, him constantly being like, I'll blow up the stadium. Like, just God, every, just like, ugh. And then I do remember that, like, he sees that thing where it's like Harley and Ivy are hooking up in the sky. <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, that makes sense. Like I can see it coming. The tension was palpable, or whatever." It's just so like he provides just a good little extra. It's like he's the seasoning on top of this already really good meal. Yeah. He's the pepper on the steak. Mm. Um, he's the cheese in the cake. Harley Quinn's crew, her her little ragtag group of misfits. Yeah, that she gets to get- she gets her crew together, and I love the crew. The crew's so yes. good. You I'll, say King Shark. I, I'm going to get the King Shark. Yeah. Let's throw a little, a little, a little wrench in the fly omen in the ring. You want to throw a wrench? You want to throw it at the wrench? <laughs> yes, I want to throw the ring at the wrench. We've been gushing about characters, but I want to talk about a character I don't like that I never really warmed up to, and that's a. Uh, Dr. Mind, or whatever the fuck his oh, name cool. is. Dr. Psycho? Dr. Psycho. Dr. Psycho. Um, yeah. I don't really know much about him in the comics. I know he's a run- Wonder Woman villain originally, but I've never really read anything with Dr. Psycho. And he just, I, I get the point of him, but he's too fucking annoying. <laughs> I can't he's, stand him. He's too much of a little bastard for you. He's, he's too much of a little bastard, and I don't like, this gets back to what I was talking about with voice actors. I just don't like Calling him out. We haven't mentioned one voice actor the entire time. Tony Hale's performance is just, it's too shrill and high-pitched and he's yeah, the whole time. And I'm just like, you don't like high-pitched. Oh, make him <laughs> stop. <laughs> uh, I think Dr. Psycho, for what he is, accomplishes exactly what he's supposed to in the narrative, which is to be the one totally unlikable asshole in this group of mm-hmm. villains that are Success surprisingly endearing. Like with that, then yeah, he he's a misogynist. You know, he he doesn't like working for a woman, but he literally has to because no one else will take him. He's uh, just a dick to everybody else on the team. He never has really any bonding with anybody else on the team. He's just always kind of like bitter and petty about everything. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly not my favorite amongst the team members, but he does exactly what I feel like they set him out to do, which is to be the dick that nobody likes and we're going to play a bunch of jokes off of him being that dick. Yeah, that is all well and good and I understand that, but it's never funny. Like, all the humor around him I think falls flat, whereas the show is always usually on the ball with humor. I think everything around him just kind of tanks. So he's the one little bit in the show uh, that I just... I don't like, and I hate how he's part of the crew because the crew in general is so fun, and I love seeing them all interact. Well, <clears throat> let's get some tiebreakers in here. Erica and Shadow, what do you think about Dr. Psycho? Yeah, Shadow, what do you think first? Uh, so just from listening to you guys talk, I was sitting here trying to think of like memorable moments mm-hmm. that Dr. Psycho had, and I can't really think of anything that he necessarily did that was memorable or that I yeah that I thought was overly funny I guess I never thought too far on who would be my least favorite character but yeah I think he I think he falls down pretty far on that list um I guess maybe the best scene was him with his son I was gonna uh, say that one (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. where they kind of make up sort of but yeah I kind of I didn't really like the arc with him going bad in the second season well he already was bad but 
betraying Harley, I yeah. guess. Um, so yeah, not not really a favorite character of mine. And if he didn't stay in the show, I I wouldn't be upset. All right, all right. She's on my team. Okay, Erica. I mean, I kind of agree. Like, I know that it's. I mean, the crew to me could honestly just be like King Shark and like Frank, the plant. Not now Clayface? Be, and, oh, yeah, and Clayface. And Clayface. Yeah, what about okay. Cyborgman? <laughs> uh, I do like Cyborg. I like Cyborgman's name, and he definitely has some funny parts, but I forget about him and Dr. Psycho. I feel like Dr. Psycho was... I liked him in the episode where they're like going into Harley's psyche. I feel like that was fun. Mm-hmm. And funny and the stuff with the um like the treadmill too. Like yeah. the big Oh yeah, and yeah. With, with the Riddler and yeah, all with that. the Riddler, that was kinda of funny. But like I just I don't feel like I have a s I definitely get what you're saying about the voice acting and it's just like a tiny bit too shrill. But I feel like I just don't have it doesn't delight me the way that like King Shark obviously does, Frank does. And I really like the way they went with Clayface. Because how many knows I love me some Clayface. I, mean, I love yeah. Clayface yes. in this. I think we're a group of Clayface fans here. Clayface is general. amazing because we talked about this in the Batman animated series. He was one of my favorite villains from that series because he was like this sort of a dick in there. And they've got mm. a completely d- different direction here where he's just this over the top, hammy, small time mm. actor who's mm. trying his best to get into every role he plays. And it's so <laughs> fucking funny because you have this big clump of mud trying to be like so serious about his acting career. And it's funny as hell. Oh, God. I don't even know Good. how to talk about him. I guess you could say he's the purest heart of the gang. Mm hmm. Because he's just, he's so into his acting. And he's just always looking for that opportunity because the most popular, used, most used version of Clayface is the, the actor version who had an accident and is now the mud monster that he is. Just the fact that they, they take the, the tragedy of him and they, they give. They tweak it in this to make it something that he just wants to take advantage of whenever he can. Is really kind of oddly wholesome. Yeah. You know, because like, yeah. here's this this villain who has been deformed for the rest of his life. But like, he, he, God damn it, he wants to be an actor and he's going to do what he has to do to give that great performance and, and to, to get that great role. <laughs> it's been a it's been a hot minute, but what w- what happens with Gordon and like the clayface hand? I knew you were going to bring it up because you love it so much. <laughs> Don't they like become best friends or whatever? They became besties, and, to- <laughs> and that's Tom Kenny. Yeah, the SpongeBob. <laughs> Fucking love it. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, my favorite Clayface episode is the one where they go to like the Riddler's college and he's disguised as like that (laughs) college girl Stephanie the whole time and he gets so (laughs) so deep into that role that he basically forgets he's Clayface yeah that was so fun that was one of my favorites too he was dating Chad yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) even at the the end of the episode he's still texting Chad he's like oh Chad (laughs) (laughs) so good (laughs) <laughs> yes, I want nothing but happy things for Clayface in this show, in this <laughs> continuity, because he deserves them. <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, my boy, I'm, I'm going to I always have to be biased, but King Shark, he, he, he's the man, no matter what his level of intelligence is, no matter <laughs> what his skill set is, he's always going to be my favorite in this. He's not the, the monosyllabic kind of, you know, talker like he is in the Suicide Squad movie. He's not like the mindless beast he often is in, in the comics. He's kind of neurotic, and he's he's the techie of the group, but he still has his, his, his moments where the shark in him kind of takes over, and he violently devours people. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I really want him to, like, I, this is obviously not going to happen in the Harley Quinn show, but I really want him to bite Superman, because his teeth... Why specifically Superman? His teeth are strong enough to penetrate Superman's skin. Yeah, that's true, because he's a god. Yeah, and... Son it, of a god. Yeah, like, it can go through, like, any Kryptonian thing, including Superman's body, and I'm just like, give it to me. Yeah, and he was Fight introduced him. as a Superboy villain. That's how he made his introduction. Oh, that's right. Yeah, with that cute little cover. I love that Clayface and King Shark are, like, besties in this show. Yeah. Like, if you just watch it, like, they're always, like, hanging out and, like, bouncing off of each other. Like, there's a great part where 
I think they're at Mr. Freeze's and like Mr. Freeze like uh, does his dramatic entrance and Cage Dark's like, oh my God, it's Beyonce. And then yeah, like yeah. Mr. Freeze shows up and then Clay's is like, oh my God, it's Lady Gaga. Yeah. <laughs> like they're just Why such the a hell fun duo. Is- they are. And they, they do have a lot of moments together. You're mm-hmm. right. Like they're always just kind of there like. They're on the back burner a little bit because, you know, Harley and Ivy are the main mm. stars, but they're just always there doing something so fun. It also bothers me to no end that his name is Mr. Freeze. And not <laughs> like, Dr. Freeze. He for sure has a doctorate and that's established. So why did he not want that title? I, if I remember correctly, his very first comic appearance, he is Dr. Freeze. I could be wrong on that point. Yeah. But I, I'm 50-50 on It's one it. of those things like where people will think it's, you know, Dr. Spock. Because that was a like the one in the pilot. He's called Doctor Spock. Yeah, and then it's like he's no, he's Mister. But you know that Spock's first name is Mister. Mister Doctor Spock. Yeah, his last name is Spock. (laughs) But any like I just can't get over it. I don't know why. I guess because science is his whole backstory. We brought this up. So I never forget. We brought this up in the BTAS episode. Episode, but like yeah. everyone in fucking Gotham has a doctorate. Like every villain yes. has a doctorate. <laughs> they do. So what you're well, saying yeah. is education is the real villain. <laughs> yes. And Shadow and I have talked about like pretty frequently that in addition to the fact that they all have like advanced degrees, it also seems like once you join up with the villains, you get some kind of like mad like vision plan. Mm-hmm. Nobody wears glasses once they become a villain, Harley included. Oh yeah, Ivy. Ivy also wore glasses when she was Pamela Isley. I guess it's Hugo just chemicals. Still wears glasses. I guess. I guess the chemicals Nobody just fix eyes. Like yeah. original Riddler, like uh, Jim Carrey yeah. Riddler. He had glasses. I guess just the new Riddler from the from the Batman is the only one that actually keeps his glasses once becoming a villain. Mm-hmm. Nerd. Well, that's because he opted for like the he opted for that different plan that teaches you how to make cards instead of giving oh, you that's like right. We did discuss the, that, yeah, yeah. To make the homemade cards. Mm-hmm. Kind of he thought that would like be more other. important to have <laughs> than the the benefits they normally give you. Now you guys want me to like prove my 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 geek cred and think of Batman villains with glasses. Um, there is Hugo Strange. He is a prominent Batman villain that wears his glasses. And I think that's about it. Really. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's Having about it. End of list. That he chose yeah. instead, like the Riddler. What's like that? Because we, we were saying that the Riddler chose yeah. to make homemade cards over the vision plan. Maybe that character also had some Yeah, other- Hugo. Strange. Yeah, Hugo Strange might have had some other benefit he was reaping from the Villains Alliance. It makes him look ultra douchey. Isn't Hugo <laughs> Strange one of the uh, doctors at Arkham? He consults at Arkham, yes, and most mostly works at Arkham, but sometimes he doesn't. Okay, maybe his deal was that he didn't get thrown into Arkham as one of the inmates instead. Yeah. <laughs> he likes to create monsters. Fun. Who don't wear glasses. And he has this weird obsession with, like, Batman, like, psychologically. Hmm. Oh, and he which, has this which really- villain doesn't? No, but like in like a sexual way. Oh, which villain does <laughs> it? I would, I would also argue that quite a lot of them. All right, fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Um, since so we talked really briefly about Batman, but like Shadow, I was hoping you could refresh my memory if this is actually in the Harley Quinn show because I remember it being, but then I also consume like a lot of media that has Batman in it. Is there a scene where Batman gives Robin a grilled cheese that has an R on it? <laughs> If there isn't, there should be. Uh, nah, there is. It's the episode where like Robin was uh, trying to become Harley Quinn's rival or whatever. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like that isn't that the only episode? Is that the only one that Robin is actually in? He shows up later in season two, very briefly, dressed up as Batman after Batman goes oh, missing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh my god! Yes, that was so oh. good. <laughs> He's just like I'll see if I do not remember the grilled cheese though. I like do. I'm still trying. To oh, I found it. Back. I just watched it too, like not too long ago. Yeah, he. I'll I'll send you. I'll send you like a clip of it later so you can see. But he like he. It's because like Isaac said, like he's upset, and Batman's like, "Hey, buddy, like brought you a yeah, little real cheese sandwich that has him. like an R on it." Batman brings it to him, and he's like, "I made this for you," and he's like, "No, you didn't, Alfred." Did. And he's like, "I made him." Yeah, make I it. made him make <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> And then it just, I love that part because it was so like Lego Batman movie. Yeah. And it also just felt so nice. There's this little tiny wholesome Batman in here when, like we said, he's mostly not in it. 
Yeah. So, oh, I love that. I was looking, I was Googling uh, Robin gets a grilled cheese sandwich and it just brought up Red Robin. So I was really disappointed <laughs> with that. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> I want to briefly touch on Cy Borgman because I feel like he's super okay. underrated member of the crew. He is so funny. This old cyborg war criminal who just has all of these horror stories from his time back in Nam and the CIA. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, he tries to incinerate all of them after he finds them unconscious in the apartment he's renting them. Because, <laughs> like, he thinks they're dead and he's like, I can't have some, but I can't afford this place if another family dies in this apartment. <laughs> Uh, he's just insane. He turns into a car at one point because oh, of CIA. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, like like disgustingly yes. turns into a car. Yeah, that was so awful. painful. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, his his arc with his sister, I actually thought was su- a surprisingly good episode. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, like you because again, like he he was an interesting character, but. Like, he's not one that I would have been like, yeah, I can't wait to have, like, an episode that centers around him. Yeah. Uh, But then having the sister that got mutated and uh, the way they did it, it it turned out really well. And that's actually an episode I remember a lot just because I enjoyed. I guess it was more of the B story. But yeah, yeah, I really liked that episode and that that kind of side plot with with him and his sister. Yeah, he's for um, a kind of made up character. He they actually do a lot with him at, by the end. He's, he also gets a really honorable death scene. Like he sacrifices mm-hmm. himself during the whole fiasco with Dr. Psycho to like free them from like this bubble that they're trapped in or whatever. Yes. <laughs> Nobody remembers that. I okay. Can't, I can't no, I remember. No, I remember. I remember. I just thought you were going to have a, more of a point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just I just thought it was cool that like they gave him like an actual respectful death. And then he comes back later as like an AI yes. in like a yeah, cassette player or yeah. something. Does that cover Oh, there's Frank. Frank the, the Frank the Flower. Oh, I plant. love Frank the Flower. <laughs> the plants. I like that he is an ass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he does have an ass, doesn't he? Yeah. Just this cute little plant ass. Underused. He's He's an underused character. They should have used Frank Moore and Dr. Psycho less. He's just a s- smart talking sidekick for Poison Ivy. Well, I think they didn't they talk about it because he he can't walk. Yeah. <laughs> so he would be hard. It would be hard to make him a main character when he can't physically move himself. Mm-hmm. I think that's why we don't see as much of him as we'd like. Because there's a whole- Ivy can give him legs. <laughs> She could, but I don't think she wants to. <laughs> <laughs> she just regrets having this sentient plant. Yeah. Who's just such a smart ass. Does that take care of the whole crew? I think that takes care of the I whole think crew. That's the crew, yeah. Any Is other- there any other like prominent character? Oh, uh, we got we, we had Gordon. We touched on Batman. We touched on Joker. There's the Queen of Fables that in one. season one. Oh yeah, Queen of Fables. She was fun. She's taken right from the comics of this very fun Justice League arc, and they just make her more of an asshole in this. Yeah, she's as, as they want to do <laughs> with this show. I kind of like how she's a main protagonist. Protagonist, God damn it, antagonist. antagonist. Yeah. Kind of atypical choice for um, the superhero property to take a kind of obs- obscure villain and make them major like That's that. Some fucked up shit kills everybody at that family reunion. <laughs> <clears throat> and there is horrible. God. I feel like we're missing somebody important. Oh, well, there's there's Catwoman. Oh yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, Catwoman's great in this. She just doesn't have any film. You know, just any things for anything. <laughs> she's just she's just over it all. And the, the, she's kind of just like how, how do you put it? Like nobody knows, like nobody can get the best of her. Like she's so everybody, cool and aloof. Yes, yeah, so she's the only one that can make like Ivy just kind of like, <laughs> oh my god! Ivy's girl crush on her is she has such a girl boner for yes, Catwoman. she stints for Catwoman so hard. <laughs> Cop Squad, that was a fun episode too. The Bachelorette party, absolutely. The Bachelorette party is one of my tip top favorite things. Like especially, it was so fun because when it starts, I'm just like, okay, so I always feel like I'm going to pronounce it wrong. It's the mascara. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, like, got it. I love how I'm just like, like, we're just here. Like, is anybody going to address the fact that like, clearly these people are like brainwashed and this is like a tourist destination now. And like, this is all wrong. And it's just so fun the way they like sink that in. Like Harley sees it and she's like, eh, yeah, yes, probably maybe something I should 
help with. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> like, oh, that whole thing and just all the dynamic of all the girls on that trip. It's so fun. It's one of my favorites of the whole series. I love it. Oh, we also get a little origin for Batgirl. Yeah. Babs. Oh, yeah. Babs is a, she's one of the students at Riddler's College, and she's stuck with her bum dad through the whole thing, and then she's finally <laughs> like, man, somebody has to stand up to all these villains. I guess I'm going to have to do it since Batman's gone. And another fun little t- tweak of a characterization where she she's not stupid, but she's kind of a, a bumbling doofus a little bit. So mm-hmm. it's fun to see her be like really enthusiastic and, and want to, you know, um, step into her dad's footprints in some way and also take on the mantle of the bat, but she's just kind of not good at it at first. This show takes so a I, lot of fun pot shots at a lot of characters like Robin, uh, which this one's Damien. Is that right? Mm-hmm. This yep, version. Damien Wayne. I love the fact that it points out that he's like a 10 year old boy running around trying to fight a bunch of grown ass people. And literally at one point, Harley just hangs him up by his underwear and is like dangling him. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't care how much assassin training you have, little boy, you're 10 and you're trying to fight grown ass adults. <laughs> it's like it's, it does a lot to undercut some of these characters in fun ways. Yeah, and they <laughs> she Harley defeats Dark Side of all people. She kind of has a squirrel girl moment when she beats the she armies of Apocalypse. Him, does she? Uh, she gets soldiers. She beats uh, Granny Good Good Granny or whatever fuck her name. Granny is. Goodness. Yeah, she beats her. Well, still, the soldiers of Apocalypse, which are you know evil gods. So Superman's not around to do it. The Justice League's not around to do it. So so this is just a random story that has nothing to do with really anything that we were just talking about. But when we were talking about the college episode, which is one of my favorite episodes, when we first watched it, uh, the friend and I that watched it together, when we saw Harley and Ivy for the first time, we were just like, why does Ivy look so different? And we're like, is it just because she braided her hair? And so for like months we had just assumed like, oh, it was just because she braided her hair. And then we came to realize it was because she was flesh toned and not green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and it just, yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> so we like to, to joke about that because we're just like, I can't believe that just braiding her hair would make her look so different. <laughs> Did you do something with your hair? <laughs> 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 your complexion uh, something <laughs> yeah there's definitely couldn't be because she was you know usually green or she anything green <laughs> is there anything else you want to hit up before we move on to like any segments or something i don't know any final thoughts before we move on to some other segments and stuff you want to do final thoughts this early i mean unless there's something else we're hitting before we move in because we got other segments and stuff we're gonna do uh, I, okay. Um, I well, guess the ahead, only Jim. thing, <laughs> the only thing that I wanted to bring up is I'm sure all of you heard about this too. Was the big controversy that was going to happen in the third season with Catwoman and Batman? Oh, yeah, yeah. How can I forget? Oh, yeah. I was I this. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about this, but I didn't really know how to approach would save it. That for the, yeah, like I was thinking maybe if we did, is it horny? Which is what we what we call that one segment, but yeah, yes, let's yeah, let's yeah, that this. yeah, just uh, it seems like what like that's the weirdest thing to draw the limit at. Yep. And what was the what did the person they said heroes don't do that? Is that what the yeah. uh, well <laughs> for for anybody not in the know in season three of Harley Quinn they were going to. I can't, I can't remember if they were going to explicitly show it or make reference to Batman performing Cunnilingus on Catwoman. And DC itself was like, no, Batman doesn't do that. And then, like, of course, mm-hmm. the entire fan base made a bunch of fan art and was like, no, Batman eats the pussy. Like, of course he does. He goes down yeah. and she loves it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I feel like was even worse is their actual quote was "heroes don't." Oh, do it that. was the heroes, not Batman. It wasn't. It, was it wasn't even just Batman. Like that, that that he's you know a fucking idiot who can't eat out. It literally was like a definitive "heroes don't do that," Which and was, so they broadcast that quote like all over 
all the exquisite pictures of him just going to town. Let's Why point, would they think that that would... Let's point out I something don't. specific about Batman. He has a cowl that covers every yes, part of his face. Yes, but his fucking mouth. His mouth. Yeah. <laughs> it's like he made the costume specifically so he can have access to I don't genitalia. Know. I was thinking, and I'm not sure if, like, I don't think this will register anything for Isaac because he hasn't watched it. It might for Shadow because her boyfriend has watch some of this show with her but there's like a really important mobster in the sopranos who (laughs) like there's a whole episode about it like he is really good at oral sex and doesn't want that to get out whatsoever and is incredibly embarrassed and like punishes his mistress when she had let it slip to like another woman because all the guys make fun of him and that as when i saw the episode i'm like i was just like man and cat woman like why is this like <laughs> poor uncle june yeah it's just like i don't and i feel like that had to be the like the mentality of the people who are like heroes don't do that like no because <laughs> it's it doesn't make any fucking sense it doesn't make any sense because the point of that episode of the sopranos is to is to highlight how illogical and backwards that these mobsters are in their sexual politics that going down on a woman makes you gay because that's their argument yeah that going down on a woman makes you gay (laughs) so like i i don't want to think in my heart that anybody at dc actually thinks that but are straight people okay (laughs) no they're not because they're they're not even a little (laughs) but like how how them saying heroes don't do that got past how many suits that had to approve of that fucking slogan is beyond me. Oh my god. It's like these people who run these these corporations who like make entertainment just they're so clueless most of the time. I, I don't think there's it. a joke in the Harley Quinn animated series comic that Shadow was talking about because I was actually reading some of it too. And uh, like Catwoman makes a reference to that because mm-hmm. she's talking about how she and Batman used to date and uh I think Harley says something about like, oh, so he doesn't actually fuck bats. And <laughs> cat woman's like, no, and he's not that big a fan of cats either. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds Harley, like one of those um, things that Frank Ch- Cho would draw. And, and then Harley and Ivy are like, oh, my gosh, girl, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> their faces, they look so distraught. Yeah, I think that was definitely a reference to that. <laughs> I had to be. They make a couple references here and there. There's actually in that party scene, that meme where the guy is like looking over his shoulder at the chick and his girlfriend's like giving him a dirty look. Yeah. They actually drew that in the party scene with some background characters and it was really cute. <laughs> oh boy. Oh man. Yeah, Freaking. Was that I really a- hope that they like go under DC's nose and sneak that oh. into season three. <laughs> I don't know if it's, like, real or not, because it's one of those things that I never, like, took the time to, like, see if it was real. Because, you know, there's, like, plenty of, like, fake J.K. Rowling tweets. I mean, yeah. some of the real things she says are so bad that at this point I'd almost believe anything. But there was this, um, like, really awesome, like, beautiful, like, sh- I'll show Tyler because he's right here. Like, drawing of Catwoman being eaten out by Batman just, like, on top yes, of this skyscraper. Yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I think and then an artist who had done work for DC for Batman, but, like, mm-hmm. wasn't currently drawing for Batman. I know which one exactly that you're talking about. Yes, because it, it literally looks so perfect. Yeah. And then the thing that I saw, like, it's a combination of two things. It's that thing, which looks legit, and then the thing I saw was that it had been it had been retweeted by Zack Snyder and he just put canon <laughs> <laughs> for it. So I never looked up if he actually did retweet it, but it obviously just gives the general vibe of what we're all thinking. And then I've seen a bunch of like, yeah, you're right, like he he doesn't eat her out, he eats out her ass. Hole. Like, uh, <laughs> I just like heroes don't do that. They eat out the butthole. Like, I don't just, I don't really All know. Are anal like, freaks. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't. I mean, if there's one, if there's one hero that is freaky in the sack, it's it's Batman. He's a leather daddy, for God's sakes. He's a leather well, it's furry exactly daddy. It's exactly like Isaac. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> like Isaac said. The cowl says it all. And and somebody else said like. To touch on, um, you know, everything is covered but his mouth. 
Somebody was also like, and he also has two convenient handles on his cowl <laughs> for her to grab onto. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, man. Ooh. Well, now that we covered that, maybe we should go on to Is It Horny? <laughs> <laughs> Is the Harley Quinn series horny? Yes, absolutely. Yes. 100%. Just hit the button. It's very horny. <laughs> I don't even know how to make a joke about it being horny because it's Tons. it's overtly sexual. Yeah. And that's the point. So we, you can't really make funnies about something that's supposed to be sexy and horny. So <laughs> just, they make all the sex yeah. jokes for it. So, yeah, uh, big thumbs exactly. up. Is it horny stamp of approval? Mm-hmm. And the stamp is a triptych image. It's a triptych image of Batwoman of Batman going down on Catwoman <laughs> while Harley watches and draws it <laughs> on like a beautiful sketch pad. Okay. I like how in the show when um after like I didn't think it would that we would that they would actually like have sex before actually getting together. I don't know why, but I didn't see before that. Before marriage, I really liked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't think that like Harley and Ivy would, and I also like how Ivy like was super in denial, and Harley was in denial, and was like, "I'm Harley Quinn, I'm crazy, I kiss everyone," <laughs> and how that became like a running gag. That was it. I love a everybody's Harley reactions to it too. Like when yeah. King Shark gets kissed, he has such like a ooh, <laughs> uh-huh. and then when Doctor Psycho gets kissed, I think he smacks her. He's like, "Get off me, you're not my type." Yeah. <laughs> she also kisses Psy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's crazy. Uh, well, Almond has been tired of being a good boy for the pod, and he is now inserting himself into our laps so he can say something. But oh, hi, Almond. We're gonna we're gonna keep him quiet as as much as we can. <laughs> Ooh, you're a good boy. Yes, it's now your pod. It's your podcast. I think he's confused because we're doing this at a later time than we normally would have. Yeah. Next segment. I guess it's time for review review. Oh, okay. You got anything up your sleeve? Uh, we're going to do the newer format. We're going to do a Common Sense Media one. All right. Bring it on. Okay. So, if you haven't listened to some of the newer episodes, I'm switching up the review review formula. Instead of going on and finding strangers online and making fun of their opinions, <laughs> like we give online, which is kind of hypocritical of us. Uh, now now we're going on to Common Sense Media, which is a website that tells you how appropriate things are, uh, usually for children. So, uh, Common Sense Media gives Harley Quinn, the animated series, a three out of five. They actually gave it like a rating. Uh, it's age 17 plus. This is reviewed by Amanda Dyer. Amanda's General synopsis is that it's a raunchy, gory comedy that has themes of female empowerment. Just so going, far, so good. Going through the segments. First segment is positive messages. For positive messages, it gets a one out of five. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <sighs> description is Harley Quinn goes on a literal trip through her sake during the series. She explores no. the trauma she faced in her relationship with the Joker and learns to overcome her past with the support of her friends. However, there is still a serious disregard for human life throughout the series. This is what's so silly about this website yeah. <laughs> is it doesn't accept the tone and content of what they review. It's like there's this weird umbrella of like decency, I guess is the word <laughs> or that they seem to like hold everything to, but they don't define it. Mm -hmm. Like, so because the show is violent and raunchy, it can't in any way have a positive message because it's dealing with morally ambiguous and complex characters. And that's like such a dumb, simplistic way to look at things. <laughs> like, what else is yeah. there? Like, no, like, think about the, like, common sense media. Who, who, who are they reviewing this for? It's a TVMA show. So you're not saying, oh, this is okay or not okay for kids. It's obviously not okay for kids. So who, who is this aimed at? Probably still parents who want to show this to their kids because that's what their <laughs> primary demographic is. <laughs> so, uh, oh well, do you have any? Um, I'm, I'm throwing this out to you all. Any other thoughts on the positive messages review? Well, uh, uh, maybe I thought you wanted to um, talk about what positive. I messages was talking are. to our other two members <laughs> on the pod right now, Tyler. What other two members? <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. I had a review that I wanted us to tear apart. Oh, fuck yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody left a review where they had a, they gave it five stars. Okay. And then they also gave it five things I loved and five things I hated and disliked. Oh wow. Which seems strange to me because you've given it five stars, but five things they loved: the animation. Okay. They said it's like classic. It's like new animated movies, but also like the old original series. Like great. It being rated for adults. Super awesome. They said the Joker look was great. They loved how much Poison Ivy there was. And then they loved the comedy. The comedy was awesome. So those are the five things they loved. Cool. Five things they hated. Harley's age. That she looks way what? too young. So what? it makes it seem like her relationship with Ivy is inappropriate. She's what? supposed to be 30. Yeah. Why did they think she looked young? I don't know. I've seen that criticism come up a lot. That it's like, oh, it's like Ivy is so much older than Harley, and she's like, it's that's not right because like it's like she's underage. And I'm like, where are you getting this? Flashback to her as a doctor. Ooh. Yeah, I was just gonna <laughs> yeah. say she's a PhD plus, for God's know, sake. Plus, she goes to visit her parents. We see that, uh, so I don't know. Um, so she hated Harley's age. She said she's older than she looks, but I hate how she looks so young. I don't um, think she looks young at all. Hated that Ivy kept saying she's not part of the crew. Like, what? Knows, she says, I know I'm nitpicking here, but the fact that Ivy kept saying she's not part of the crew. She does say that a lot. Okay, yeah, but, but like, that's literally her personality. That's not a criticism. No, it's not a criticism. That's but just... but this, this review gets worse because, okay, <laughs> things that they also didn't like Ivy's look because it was really plain. Fair. I mean, we no. talked about that. Yes. Did, yeah. Fourth thing that they hated and disliked: the fucking swearing is too fucking much. Did I not make it fucking clear? There is <laughs> a person lot of thinks fuck. you're so funny. Yes. And then, if you remember, the thing that they loved about this show was the comedy. But then, what they also hated and disliked is they said it was too much comedy. Oh, okay. oh that's their yes. last one? The last one is too <laughs> much comedy. I loved it, but it was just a bit too much comedy. It was too much of the thing that I show. loved. I wanted yes. less love. Oh, God. It's really, really, really funny to me, this review. And I just... Oh my god, I don't know. The be praising it for its its adult rating, but then being like it's cursing too much. <laughs> Loving the comedy, saying it's awesome, it's in your top five favorite things, but then also saying I hate that because there's perhaps too much of it. I just it really makes you wonder because what? what kind of people are out there in the world, you guys? Like, how does this make sense in someone's head that they would that they would do this? Okay, to give a little bit, a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. I can kind of see where they're coming from with the cursing. Um, I think it's fine in this show, but sometimes I'm watching something that has a lot of profanity and depending on how it's delivered and acted, it can become grating. Do you have an example? Uh, yes, actually, which this um, is, a, is a good counter to our last episode because I was just uh, raving about how I got a tweet liked by James Gunn. Mm-hmm. Um, Peacemaker, overall, a really good show, but I think the cursing in it's just a little too... F- it's just they emphasize fuck a lot, like the way they enunciate it. It, it gets kind of annoying. Or like it's like, okay, Seth like we Rogan get it. Comedy. <laughs> Huh? Like any Seth Rogen comedy, too? Yeah, like, there's only so many times I can hear a character go, yeah. fuck, or fuck, or fuck, before I'm like, okay, I get it, you guys can say fuck, like, can we move past it now? So, a little bit of the benefit of the doubt there. Not everybody can be Martin Scorsese with the fuck words and make it sound like poetry. Well, fuck. <laughs> I know, fucking A, right? I also like that I started off talking about the new format of review review as we don't want to make fun of strangers on the internet. And then and Erica we, yeah. just tore <laughs> ass through this person. Absolutely. <laughs> well, when somebody has a shitty criticism, uh, uh, they deserve criticism. Yes, with that. But they gave it five stars. Yeah, that's a perfect score. Yeah. <laughs> it's It literally can't. It's not like they gave it four. <laughs> Even that's yeah. what really struck me when I was reading the reviews is that it was like I absolutely love it, love the comedy, but I also hate the comedy. Like it was, it was very interesting. Perhaps Two Face wrote it, maybe <laughs> while flipping the coin. Yeah, that might make sense. But um, I also thought it was uh, when you guys were talking the your original intent for this. 
I also saw a couple of reviews where people were like, oh, like Harley Quinn's a bad person, so you shouldn't watch this show because like she's not a role model. Oh my god, I, I like, hate these like concerned trolls who just like complex characters who aren't a hundred percent good are are bad because my feelings. Well, yeah, let's let's talk about this because in. This series in particular, it's not just, like, morally ambiguous. Harley Quinn and most of the other characters in this show are explicitly villainous. They are bad yes. people doing bad things. Mm-hmm. So I think there is an argument to be made to, like, what messages are we endorsing here? I think there is certainly something to look at as how much can we take any moral message that this series is trying to promote seriously when we're following people who are literally murdering left and right. Yeah, but I think that's where tone comes into play. You know, when it's something so like overtly silly, that is what's supposed to buoy like everything else. You know, that that's what allows it to tell the, the more nuanced story with the emotion and the heart and, and the character development. Even though they're, you know, a lot of them are murderers and they do villainous things. The absurdity of, of the world and the comedy is supposed to take the edges off of that. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to take fiction, especially fan- fantastical fiction, on, on a one-to-one basis. You know, that's kind of the point of stories. <laughs> there's a give and take. There's a, there's an allowance you give these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe other people are thinking about it, like, deeper than me, because some of the people... Uh, you know, there's like a bunch of people who are like, like I saw this one meme and it was like Harley holding hands with Ivy and Ivy holding hands with Kite Man. And it was like, these are both wrong. Ivy has two hands and it was her holding hands with both of them. <laughs> like, so anyway, my point being, there's like some people who are like, oh yeah, like they should have been a throuple. And then there's other people who are just like, oh, like this show is terrible because like, Kite Man was like I've literally seen like one star reviews and stuff where they were like just like this this is like I love the first season or whatever but then season two like oh my it's just you know these people are such terrible people and like Kite Man got like cheated on and like the, it's just everything is like these people are awful and I'm just like yeah, they're like villains. they're they're villains <laughs> like I was never sitting here like worried like oh no Ivy's gonna get with Kite Man and that's not fair because she's cheated on him. That was never a concern I had because these are fucking villains. I don't expect them to make good choices, and I don't expect good things to happen to them. Yes, like that's implicit. Yes. Like implicit in the whole thing. There's this growing thing I've seen online with people who like concern troll about the content of film and television and stuff like that, where they seem to take everything at face value, where if something depicts a problematic character who might be, I don't know, the racist or or sexist or something. And they just, they take it at face value and assume that it's endorsing that behavior and that mindset. And like, no, like that's, where's the, where's the media literacy with you people? Like depiction does not equal endorsement. Yes. Depiction is not endorsement. Even though the show humanizes the villains in like their emotions and relationships, like, it doesn't excuse their villainy. Like the villainy is constantly like showcased to be like something absurd and something that always backfires in their faces and something that is like the cause of most, if not all of their problems is that they're villains. Like if they maybe just stop trying to be villains, maybe they can get their shit together. A thing doesn't need to stop itself and give, you know, a speech to the audience to be like, Hey, by the way, this is bad. No, they need to put a thing at the end the way they did for like He-Man and G.I. Joe and like Sailor Moon in the 90s where it's like, hey, kids, you know, if you ever feel like not eating because you think that you're ugly, like make sure you tell an adult. Like they have to just put in like a little message at the end. But this is for adults. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a kid's show. <laughs> so that's even worse. No, we still need it, apparently. It's really funny also that that was a thing that multiple shows now, did. Now, to be fair, there's plenty of adults I know that do need moral messages explicitly spelled uh, out for them. Yeah, <laughs> but most people are too far gone. And also probably not watching the Harley Quinn show. Probably not. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was there more to the Common Sense Media thing? Or are we oh, yeah, scrapping there's like it a, after there's the first There's a whole point? bunch to it, but like, fuck it. <laughs> okay, but fuck it. We will. Erica tends to derail review, review for the best. 
<laughs> yes, that is a trend with you it when is, you're yeah. on the pod as you derail review review. You mean like with one of the most popular review reviews with the uh, person who wrote about baseball? Yes, for Twilight. Yes. So My great. favorite. I, I really appreciate that they took the time to do that. I feel like we need to give our guest uh, something else to say. Um, <laughs> got anything to say about all of that just now? <laughs> Should I? Uh, well, I was trying to th- to think of something. Um, I guess kind of meshing the two things that w- the reviews together. I know we were talking about like positive messages. I was just thinking that even though the positive message goes along with not positive things that doesn't really take away from the positive message. Mm. So just because like Ivy and Harley are villains do kill people. That doesn't mean that Harley deserved to be abused by Joker. Right. And that that was a good message. Maybe you didn't like the other parts of it, but don't detract from the fact that this show did say, hey, it's not okay for your significant other to mentally and physically abuse you, even though you do kill people. (laughs) There's also, I think Tyler touched on this a bit, but there's a level of absurdity with the villainy that like, no one needs to be told not to go out and murder. Yeah. Like, no rational person needs to be told that they shouldn't go out and murder. So we can have these characters that are doing all this incredible, brutal violence and everything, also undergoing moral arcs, like learning to get past their abuse and trauma and all that, and learning how to, like, stand up in this patriarchal society that they've been set in. But it's not undermined because we understand that the terrible things they're doing are terrible and we don't need that message because we already know as an audience that like, yeah, murder is bad. We can focus on the other moral messages that are a bit more complex and the show does good enough to never treat the actual moral messages that it's discussing as jokes in the same way that the violence is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and even though there's an irreverence to it, like if Harley's bashing somebody in the head with her baseball bat, there's still that level of uh, oh gosh, you know, like ooh, that's that's rough. Like you know, it's, it's yeah, just 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 be just be more media literate, people, please, please. I'm so sick of take havers not having a clue about anything yeah. they're having a take on. <laughs> I just I think it's so interesting. Like I know that we were saying we don't want to like shit on people. I mean, honestly, no, I think they deserve to be shit on because they decided to put their opinion. You you decided to put your opinion on the internet. You made that choice. That's why I love you. I am not a person who goes on the internet. I'm a lurker. I will read (laughs) things and I will think my own thoughts. And if I don't like something, I'm not going to be like, oh shit, well, I need to school you guys. Or I need to like, I'm not the kind of person who's going to go to a restaurant, have a bad experience and then go leave a one star review. I just live my life. I just have things in in my brain like a normal person i don't have to vomit it on the internet so if you're going to take the time to go out there and be and be you know putting this stuff here you you deserve my derision or perhaps <laughs> that of others but like there's one person for example and i was thinking about what Shido was saying about how she likes how they have the pink and blue look and i liked it too this one person this one guy left a bad review he reviewed the whole series bad and he was like you know, basically saying that he was so hyped for the show and then he watches the show and they completely ruined her character by using updated Harley where she looks stupidly gothic. This is for modern youngsters who didn't grow up with the original. They were, he was upset uh, that the, the 90s, gatekeepers. yeah, the 90s style costume was used in the first episode. And so only that one episode is good because then after that, she doesn't wear it. So you shouldn't watch this. Just for that reason, you should only watch the 90s animated show. I <laughs> cannot understand. I know. And so the significance of her not wearing that anymore. No. And there if, isn't if, any. It's just so these people can feel superior. Like, I was there in the beginning, so I yeah. know better. And that's such a small, tiny thing to, to absolutely ruin your experience. And not only ruin your experience, but to warn others not to watch this. Because there's nothing to gain because her look is not a way that I like. I'm judging and this I woman get, inclu- exclusively by her clothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, I also do get, because Tyler and I have talked about this, when you like something so much, like, you know, you're just like, oh no, it's this thing that I like. It's for me. 
But like if when we think about gatekeeping, and I've said this like since high school, if you're going to enact that, then nobody gets to have access to something. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like the, then only the band can say they are the real fans because they were there from the beginning. Nobody else is allowed to like them. Everybody else only liked them once they started putting their music out. <laughs> like there's there's no way that it makes sense. And then I just, again, I just. There's this thing that I've noticed with Harley Quinn as a character specifically, and I'm generalizing here, but most people that I hear that have a problem with her are dudes. Dudes that don't like how she became so popular. That was a dude who loved that. Dudes that don't like how her look has been updated or changed. That she's not super devoted to Joker anymore. Oh, so like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, like, and dudes more specifically who like have this weird fixation on her costumes that aren't the classic Harlequin costume, and it's mm-hmm. like there's like this weird thing going on with them. Whereas like she got a bit more sexy and like assertive with her physicality where these people all of a sudden they're kind of like are they threatened by her now like do they not want do they want their horniness for her to be a certain way and not like this way like (laughs) no no we all need some chill like (laughs) most of those bad reviews that i found the one and two stars were written by men and a lot of them it was critiquing the way she looked to the person who said that she's a bad role model that was a man and I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. Like, there's a lot of dudes out there with the opinion of, oh, I don't know why people idolize Harley Quinn because she's not a good person. And it's like, you just kind of have a problem with a female character having neither a huge is. female Deadpool, fan base. Neither is. And there the are people like the Joker. There probably is. know, like, yeah. Joker's whole backstory. Yep, mm. exactly. Should know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, she knows 100% right. I love Joker. And, 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 it, and he said, like, she was, like, too goth. Like, do you fucking people know what goth is anymore? No, I was thinking that, too, because how you could look at that and not her original fucking white-faced makeup. Yeah, you know, goth. You know, like, red and pink and blue. And blue. <laughs> yeah. hair. She's not goth because her skin is pale. Jesus Christ, goth is a specific look. It's not multicolors. Did they mean punk? God's sakes. They could, yeah, like it would be more accurate if they described her as too punk, yes. But of course, they have to use goth, probably because she has eyeliner and pale skin. That's the only thing I can assume. Anyway, well. <laughs> I love bitching about chuds on the internet, so um, <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> I guess that kind of <laughs> wraps things up for this. <laughs> that kind of wraps up tongue and queer for this month. Um, Oh, recommendations? Oh, shit. I, man, I'm dropping the ball in more ways than one. I have a couple. Hell yeah. Yes. Obviously, um, since she started in the animated series, anything that comes comic-wise comes after that. The Mad Love comic series by yes. Paul Dini and Pat Cadigan, that kind of gives Harley's backstory. It's super good. And yeah, that is definitely... Uh, a wreck that I do have. Erica actually turned me on to this graphic novel, Harleen. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say his name so wrong. <laughs> I was uh, just thinking that. <laughs> Shep Pan Sajic. Oh, yeah. That one. Uh, and then, of course, as we talked about, uh, the Eat Bang Kill Tour uh, by T. Franklin, that that's an amazing series. Very fun. Very cute art in that last one. Mm-hmm. So much, yes. So gay too. So gay. <laughs> the <laughs> recommendation um of Harleen is such a good one. I gotta read that. Um and I own it, so you easily can. It's great because it's aw- amazing Harley, beautiful art, and then also Isaac and I have a planned episode where we're going to talk about the the comic book writer and artist also has another thing that Isaac and I love called Death Vigil. Were Sajajic. Yeah. Yes. Sajajic <laughs> is a very, very horny artist. <laughs> like, <laughs> so horny. Very good art, but so horny. Any, I mean, all the best art's horny in my Anything opinion. with his name on it is an immediately yes on the is it horny scale. <laughs> I guess I got a wreck and it immediately left my brain as soon as I thought about it. 
what the fuck was I going to say? The Injustice comic based off the video game. I mean, it's a huge ensemble with the entire DC universe, but Harley herself is really well done in it and has a really great arc. So, um, yeah, pick that up. Cool. Erica, you Injustice. Got oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> so the only wrecks that I really have are ones that I one I've mentioned and one I think I've probably given before, but the 2007 comic Harley and Ivy, so good. It's like the definitive Harley and Ivy. You have to start there. There's like a deluxe edition that came out in 2016 that looks really cool, but oh, it's it's really, really perfect. And then I think I, I feel like I've talked about this for something else we did, um, or maybe possibly it's just possible I was talking to my extremely good friend Shadow, and that's why I think <laughs> I've wrecked it before. But the comic No Man's Land also should okay. very much be read, um, can be read as a book or read as a comic. But everything that Harley and especially Ivy are doing in that, it's just, it's so amazing. They are truly just being like feminist badasses. Just, um, it, I think it changed uh, Harley's origin in there, if I remember correctly, but it's so fun. A lot of reading, No Man's Land. It's um, over 100 issues. Um, so if you want to crack that open, it's going to take you some time. It's a fantastic Batman story. And uh, I think, oops, sorry, I was going to say, yeah, you can read the book. I think the book's out of print. It condenses it, and it's really good, too. Is our copy of Batman No Man's Land, the book, really worth $50? I was going to say, it's out of print, so people are going to be asking a pretty penny for it. Hmm. Wild. It's so good. Good Joker in there, too. I'm going to give a couple of non-Harley Quinn-related recommendations. One of them How dare we, you? One of them we have to mention during Tongue and Queer. Uh, we're not getting to it this year just because scheduling issues and stuff, but Our Flag Means Death. I think we briefly touched on it in the she thing, but phenomenal mm-hmm. HBO series about a bunch of gay, pan, poly pirates, transgender. Lots and lots and lots of good representation done very well. It's very funny, very heartfelt. A fanta- One of the best gay romances I've ever seen put to media and... Just so good. Cannot recommend Our Flag Means Death Enough. Um, mm-hmm. And just got renewed for season for two. Yeah, they season. waited till Pride Month like fucking douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> like that was 100% purpose. Not not by any of the creators, obviously. But by the network. That was obviously on purpose. So Jerks. Maybe down the line we'll get a review for that one. Definitely a great series, but uh, just scheduling issues and stuff. We didn't get to that one, but we all love it. Uh, other series I'm going to recommend based on Harley Quinn. And... Uh, I kind of realized looking back that they're very similar is the Venture Bros, um, which was an ongoing cartoon yeah. or adult swim series. I think there's a lot of similarities in the not just like the comedy, but like the art style, the whole mm-hmm. like superhero slash like high sci fi concept parody going on there. It's very similar in the sort of like comedy that it's doing and the sort of darker themes it wants to hit on it's a lot of fun i've enjoyed it i think it got canceled on its second to last season so you know fair warning for that it kind of fizzles out instead of being brought to a full conclusion but there's a lot of fun stuff in it i really enjoy it um, watch it it's so good it's so funny um there was something the somebody monitor. mentioned earlier about Oh, I think it was when, Erica, you mentioned, like, how Cop Man and Avi and ha- Harley should have just been in a polyamorous relationship. First off, in mm-hmm. the comics, I think Harley is poly, at least in uh, one of the more recent issues. But uh, there's a joke in the Venture Bros that the Monarch makes. Like, it, the, like one of his henchmen, I think, sleeps with his wife. And the Monarch mm-hmm. is just like, I, why would I care? We're villains. We swing. Like, it's like, yeah. it's like not a big deal. <laughs> I killed yeah. a guy the other day. You think I care if my wife fucks somebody else? Yeah. Um, I love the Monarch. He's, like, one of the best parts of the show. So funny. I mean, Brock's also amazing. Uh, I saw Harley, I saw this show get compared a lot in reviews to Rick and Morty. Really? Which I'm wondering if it's just because the violence, like the blatant, like exposed bone and such. Yeah. I feel like that's that. I mean, I don't feel like the humor style or storytelling or anything is similar. It just, it has to be that and that both of them are funny. Rick and Morty's like, a lot the more only- like cerebral in its yeah. themes. 
and also a lot more stupid in its humor. <laughs> like, uh, like it's it's very yeah, much on the opposite weird. ends. Yeah. <laughs> Rick and Morty is like the dumbest smart show out there, or the smartest dumb show, one or the other. <laughs> well, Isaac, you know you do have to have a uh, million IQ. IQ to, yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> let's get off that and just rate the damn thing and be done with it. Who wants to give the first rating for Harley Quinn the animated series? Uh, I rate it good show out of good show. Okay. Don't all jump at once. Okay, it's gonna be it's gonna be four and a half ivy leaves on a vine for me. Cute. Uh, I'm gonna have to say it's gonna be a ten out of ten diamonds. Nice. Mm. I'm gonna give it eight hundred out of a thousand pair of demons. Um, I also uh-huh. think I think it's adorable. Also, that like me and Tyler stumble all over each other trying to get words out, and then Erica <laughs> and Shadow are like too polite people standing like no you go first no you go first no, you go first. <laughs> but um i think that's gonna do us for us today here on tongue and queer and that's gonna wrap up tongue and queer this year um if you enjoyed the episode be sure to like us on youtube or rate us on whatever platform you're listening on drop a comment share us on with your friends follow us on twitter and instagram at tongue and geek that is at tongue and geek all mm, one word share us with your friends you say mm. <laughs> Thanks again to Shadow for joining us and for the art for this episode that will be up on YouTube. We'll also share it on our Instagram and our Twitter page so that everybody can see. And thank you all for joining us here at Tongue and Queer. And remember, don't throw your baby in the trash.